Since reporting their Q2 results, Redwire stock has seen a sell-off to the tune of negative 40%. Now that we've had some time to digest, let's look things over to determine if the sell-off is finished, if the sell-off is warranted, or if the worst is yet to come. My name is Scott, welcome to the channel. Let's talk Redwire. So starting with the share count. In the pre-Q2 video, I mentioned 185 million shares to be the worst case scenario in terms of dilution following the Edge Autonomy acquisition. This ended up coming in at a much more palatable 143 million shares, representing an 84% increase compared to Q1 end, aka pre-acquisition. Now, to be fair, we will still see more dilution, but not this full worst case of 185 million shares. Similar to share count, debt came in much better than expected as well, with 191 million total, split between 5 million short term and 186 million long term. We didn't cover this in the last video, but liquidity is in a better place as well. As of Q2 end, Redwire had 114 million, providing them a decent runway as they figure out profitability as this new Redwire version 2.0 over the next several quarters. Zooming out to look at the balance sheet as a whole, we have the total assets less goodwill of 719 million, total liabilities of 449 million, resulting in equity less goodwill of 270 million. Next up, we gotta get the ugly stuff out of the way. We gotta talk about backlog, bids, and contracts. Despite acquiring a company that's twice their size, Redwire has somehow managed to actually decrease their backlog year over year. This is one of the largest red flags in this print and is underlined with the bid to contract comparison. Despite seeing roughly four times the bids in 2024 compared to 2023, awards have remained relatively flat. All right, so I don't wanna just recklessly hand wave this away like it's nothing. It's definitely a point of concern, but I think when you factor in, you know, be it tariffs, the big beautiful bill, how that's going to kind of act or counteract with the Inflation Reduction Act, um, uh, decrease in budgets, be it NASA or many other entities, uh, lack of NASA having a permanent administrator. When you factor in all those items, it kind of makes sense that there's no contracts that are being delegated for the time being. Um, to make a crass analogy, it's like if you're set to build a home, but you won't know the price of lumber for another three months, you're probably gonna wait three months to order your lumber, right? Because if that lumber comes in being three, four times more expensive than you otherwise thought of, you might, I don't know, build your house with brick or something. I don't know. You understand what I'm saying? It's just, it's kind of understandable in the kind of medium to short term that there haven't been any contracts delegated. Now, if Redwire is in the similar scenario in one, two, or three quarters after the contracts should be being delegated for SDA again, um, for Golden Dome as well, especially among numerous other contracts or projects, I should say, that's when I would call this a true red flag. But I think it's kind of excusable because this isn't something that you're just seeing within the space industry. This is kind of across the board. It's that everyone's in a bit of a holding pattern as we try to make sense of things. So I guess all this to say is um, backlog is definitely worth watching closely going forward, but to be kind of you know, blindly optimistic, we're going to give it a pass for, for now. So keep that in mind going forward. That's all. Next, let's pivot into the income statement. Q2 revenue came in at 62 million, highlighting 0.6% growth quarter over quarter and negative 21% growth year over year. Past this, Redwire reduced full year revenue guidance to what is now 385 to 445 million. Additionally, Redwire redacted guidance for adjusted EBITDA in its entirety, citing uncertain timing of government contracting, as we just went over a moment ago. Alongside revenue, margins also took a hit with this new and improved Redwire, going from what was previously a 15% gross margin average all the way down to 31%, with operating margin going from a negative 20% average all the way down to negative 149%, Past this, we also have a free cash flow margin and negative 151%, similar to operating margin. And finally, we have the adjusted EBITDA margin at negative 44%. Now, let's make things interesting. 
For the rest of the video, I'm going to steel man in favor of Redwire. The reason that I'm doing this is because there currently seems to be one opinion only at the moment, and that is that Redwire's management all need to be fired because the stock is going to zero, the exact kind of sentiment you'd see when a stock takes a 60% haircut in less than two months. So I'm gonna play the role of contrarian and make a case as to why things maybe aren't bad as they seem. In Q2, there was a one-time EAC impact of $25.2 million. This was primarily from a single program within Redwire's radio frequency systems offering. For those unfamiliar, an EAC is an estimate at completion. This is a project management metric that represents the current forecast of a project's total cost when it is finished, combining actual costs incurred to date with the expected costs for the remaining work. Translated to English, Redwire is running over budget along other programs. Mentioned on the Q2 call is that this one-time EAC impact was actually from a recently completed third quarter review and that it was recognized in the second quarter instead. In my opinion, the reason Redwire chose to recognize this in Q2 rather than Q3 is because they were already set to have a not so hot Q2 with all the impacts from the edge autonomy acquisition. So they chose to load all the bad news into one quarter rather than dragging it out between multiple quarters. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna strip away all of these one-time impacts that Redwire had in Q2 to see what things look like in the alternate timeline where Redwire does not acquire edge autonomy. So the first adjustment we'll make is to move this EAC impact from Q2 back into Q3. To do this, let's hop over to the 10Q, which tells us that this $25.2 million EAC impact was split between $17.7 million in revenue, 7.2 million cost of sales, with the remaining 0.3 not being stated, so we can assume this to fall within the other income or expense line item. Next, let's factor out the impact that Edge Autonomy had on the income statement in Q2. So as we can see here, Edge had a $6 million impact to revenue and a negative $35 million impact to net income. The limited revenue impact is due to the Edge acquisition closing on June 13th, so there were only 17 days worth of revenue that was recognized within the quarter. As for net income, a $35 million loss on $6 million of revenue is huge, but we also need to make another adjustment. Baked into this 35 million is $29.6 million worth of edge autonomy related equity-based compensation. So we're going to back this out as well, but keep in mind that going forward, this $29.6 million impact, this is the first of three tranches with the second tranche to be recognized one year after the acquisition, so June 2026, and the third tranche to be recognized one year later in June of 2027. The value of each of these two remaining tranches is expected to be this $57.3 million split between the two tranches, so roughly the same $30 million that we saw for tranche one. After removing this equity-based compensation, we are left with negative 5.2 million that is then extracted through the income statement in rations that are based on the annual pro forma data that we covered in the last video. So zooming into operating expenses, we can see an uptick in transaction expenses in Q3 of 2024 related to the acquisition of Harris Systems. This uptick hovers around the four to $5 million mark before seeing another jump in Q2 of 2025 related to the edge acquisition. Realistically, the majority of Q2's transaction expenses are related to edge rather than Hera, but to be conservative, we'll remove this increment, leaving us around the $4 million mark that we've seen over the past few quarters for Hera systems. One final adjustment we'll make is to interest expense. During the quarter, Redwire recorded a one-time interest expense of $20 million tied to the early repayment of the $100 million seller note used to finance part of the edge autonomy acquisition. So let's put this all together. We have the Q2 results. From here, we're pushing the EAC impact back into Q3, removing the impact that edge autonomy had on the income statement in Q2, including this first tranche of equity-based compensation, as well as the effect the seller note repayment had on interest expense. When all is said and done, even after all these adjustments, 
Q2 wasn't Redwire's strongest quarter, but it was by no means as bad as it appears without context. To take it a step further, Redwire's earnings release was out on August 6th after market close, but the 10Q, all the intricate stuff that we went over in this video, that wasn't released until the following day after the sell-off had already taken place. To say this another way, the stock sold off without any context as to what caused the numbers to appear as bad as they did. My approximation is that the market was expecting the edge autonomy acquisition to be immediately accretive without any consideration of restructuring, charges, or fees along the way. So in reality, embedded within Q2 were all of the acquisition-related impacts, but only 17 days worth of Edge's influence on the income statement. So if the market wants to respond to a Q1 to Q2 comparison like this without the context, then I guess in theory, and I say this with a large asterisk, they'll have to do the same between Q2 and Q3 as well. Factoring in the post-acquisition share count of 143 million tells us that Redwire was trading in Q2 with the price to sales of just shy of 14. With mid-range full-year revenue guidance of 415 million, that puts Redwire's second half of the year at a mid-range revenue rate of $146 million per quarter, outlining a forward price to sales of two. So not only is the price of sales going from 14 to two, but Redwire's margin profile is going to be in a much better place as well, with Edge being reflected in full force going forward. So all this to say, based on what I'm expecting for the second half of this year and beyond, I feel comfortable taking 50% of the gains from what I sold in June and putting it back into Redwire at these levels. Now, as to whether I hit the bottom, your guess is as good as mine. There are still a couple points of concern that remain, namely the backlog and the contract awards, but I'm assuming, this is not financial advice, do your own research, of course, but I'm assuming that the sell-off, that the majority of it is out of the way, especially compared to the highs we saw just a couple months ago. I want to hear from you, though. Do you think the sell-off is finished? Do you think the worst is yet to come? Where do you see Redwire by the end of the year? Comment below, like and subscribe if you haven't already, and be sure to check out Patreon to view and download the valuation models that I referenced to make these videos here for you that include everything from financials to key performance indicators to insider ownership, and of course, the price targets that I use to determine fair value. The models available via Patreon are for Rocket Lab, Shift4, Planet Labs, Black Sky, and now introducing Redwire. As always, thank you for the support, thank you for the hangout, I look forward to seeing you in the next one, and I hope you have an awesome day.